Well, good morning. Glad you could be with us today. You know, if you're visiting, I want to encourage you to get a hold of the uh, online bulletin. That's on our website. You can download that, and that will provide you with links to all the important things that you might need to know about as we go through our worship today. It also has an online connect card, which will enable you to connect with us so that we can connect with you. We want to get you connected to community during this pandemic. It's so important to have relationships, not to descend into isolation. And, and we're a church is equipped to help with that. And so we want to help you fill out that Connect card and uh, return that to us. And we'll let you know what the opportunities are that we have for you to get in community. And that, that goes true if you're a visitor or if you're a regular part of our community and you're looking for more, uh, we want to work with you on that and help to connect you with that. So I um, want to encourage you, too, to continue to join us. You know, this last month or so, uh, Barna came out with a study that describes trends that have taken place within the church since the pandemic started. And one of the findings they talk about in this study is that people who continue regularly to worship demonstrate much less anxiety than those who've fallen away from worship. And so I want to just encourage you, you're doing a good thing by being here with us this morning and every Sunday morning. So keep on joining us. This week, we're going to return to our series in the book of Acts. And the message for today is called, What Are You Waiting For? So that'll be happening a little bit later. Right now, we're going to take some time to sing, to worship God. I want to encourage you to do that in your home. So let me pray for us as we begin. Lord, we are grateful to be able to, quote unquote, gather in this way this morning. Um, we long for the moment when we can come back in community, to be able to, to be face to face, to be able to hug one another and encourage one another with conversation and presence. But we're going to take this moment and make the most out of it. And so I pray that in our homes, in this place, you would clear aside distractions this morning. Help us to focus on you. We desperately need to keep our eyes trained on you. I think of, of Peter when, when he began to doubt and, and, and he looked away and he began to sink as he was walking on the water towards Jesus. Lord, we want to keep our eye. We don't want to sink. We want to keep our eyes trained on you this week. And so, so would you right now help us to fix our gaze upon you as we seek you in worship, as we seek you in prayer, as we seek you in community, as we seek you in the, in the word, the scriptures, Lord, descend upon us wherever we are by your spirit and have your way with us, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Sin of the world, his blood breaks the chain. Then every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow. So open up the gates, here we go. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. Our God has come to save, His head to set the captive free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fire. Battles and every knee will bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chains, and every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Oh, every knee. the Lord Almighty. Let's lift our voices together. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop 
stop, Lord? Who can stop, Lord Almighty? 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 Our, our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. bow before him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain and every knee will bow before the our God. Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles and every knee will bow before For the sin of the world, his blood breaks the chain, and every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Oh, every knee will bow, and every knee will bow. Solano family. My name is Melody Julius and I'm going to be reading our call to worship scripture this morning from Romans 10, 12 to 17. We're going to be turning our attention back to the teaching in Acts and looking at the call to evangelism. Read with me. Since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. Sing, you hear me when I call. Stay. 
good to sing songs of praise and worship just um to speak of the strength of god and and, uh his protecting spirit uh just because you know in these uncertain times it's just uh i find myself worried a lot and anxious a lot and uh it's good to know that i don't have to be strong all the time uh, because because god is there uh taking care of me amen
Well, I love that I can still pray for us, even though I can't see all of us. So would you join me right now uh, as we spend some time in prayer? Lord, the second wave of this pandemic is upon us, and with it come other kinds of waves, waves of uncertainty, um, waves filled with questions, really, about what the future will look like and how we will move through it, how we will hold everything together, how we will continue to, to provide for each other, for ourselves, for our families, how we'll continue to navigate the important things, the things that matter to us most. So we want to come before you and ask for your help today. I want to ask for the, your help on behalf of all who are with us this morning. I think of the fall season, which is now within, you know, our view, and for our young families who are thinking through what school will look like in this fall, and working through plans, and having to shift and change plans over and over again. Um, God, would you just empower and strengthen them for that important work? For, for our college students and our, our high school students, um, our graduate students who are facing myriad of uncertainties as they consider the fall season and what it's going to look like, sense of loss uh, over what might have been and what's not going to be. God, would you minister your grace and your peace? And, and, and just that reminder that your great superpower is your ability to redeem all things. And even what we think we've lost can be redeemed and restored in ways sometimes even better than, than what we imagined. And so help us to be a people of hope in the midst of this moment. And I, and I pray for those who now with the second wave are experiencing uncertainty regarding work, and whatever it is that the calling might be. Um, God, would you, um, again, remind us that you will never leave us or forsake us, that you are there, that you, you're not surprised by what's happening, that you are over it all. God, we add to this the complications of what is also entry into a, a heavy political season, which we know is going to result in a, a heavy season of media and news cycles. And we're reminded that in the midst of all of it, you made us out of dust, and dust isn't capable of carrying all these things, and that's okay. And so, in the midst of what we're facing, God, we ask that you would be our strength. And we remind ourselves of who you are, that you sit above the circle of the earth, that you are, you are separate, you are holy, you are greater than. And, and as I've said, nothing surprises you. Nothing is happening on this earth is greater than your power. We remind ourselves that, that you weighed the all the seas in just the hollow of your hands, that the span of your hand is large enough to measure the universe itself, and, and that all the nations, as we think about this heavy political season that we're entering into, all the nations are as fine dust on the scales for you, because you are so great. You are so powerful. You are so amazing, and so we bow before you, maker, sustainer, redeemer, and we worship you today. And in the truth of your majesty, we find comfort and strength for tomorrow and the next day and the next day. We praise you and we thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So I want to invite you at this time as we have a kind of moment of announcement and just thinking about what is happening in our community to connect with one another through the various chat opportunities on Twitch and YouTube and Facebook, the in-house Facebook. Uh, I want to ask you this question as we're listening to our announcements for today. What is one thing right now that you're thankful for? Put that in the chat box, and, and let's have a little bit of community time as we're listening to the announcements today. Go to it.
Hello, and welcome to your favorite game show, Sundays at Solano. I'm your host, Esther Wong. I'll be taking you through all of our weekly announcements and asking you to participate throughout that whole time. So, this is an interactive game, so if you're watching with other people, be the person to shout it out. Uh, you can also type in the answer on Twitch if you're watching on that. So, you ready? Three, two, one, go! First things first, shout out to all of our new friends at Solano! Be the first person to say a welcome message to our new people, go! So many nice things, did you hear that? If you do consider yourself new or just want to get plugged in, you can fill out our connect card on our website. You can request prayer, find out about home groups, and get connected with our church. If you do call Salon Church your home, you can give online at our website. If you need any help, you can contact giving at salonofchurch.org. <laughs> Question, who is our financial secretary? That's right, Lucy Lim. Shout out to Lucy. If you have kids, we have Sunday school. This starts before service at 9 a.m. However, <laughs> what time should you log on? That's right, 8.50 a.m. We also need some additional virtual teachers. So if you're interested in that, please contact Ryan at salonofchurch.org. Now I know that community has been really difficult to find and maintain during this time. So if you're interested in finding that community, we have home groups for you. Quick question, who should you contact to get placed into a home group? That's right, Pastor Dante. You can contact Pastor Dante at dante at salonchurch.org. Next announcement, back to school supply drive. I know that distance learning has been really difficult. Believe me, I'm a teacher, I know. But this pandemic has disproportionately affected children from under-resourced communities. So um, that is why Solano has decided to partner with City Team Oakland to provide school supplies for those students. Quick question, what is a school supply that you can donate? I heard so many good things. We will be collecting donations all the way through August 10th. So you can contact Julie at the email in your bulletin for more information. The Faith and Race team invites you to a discussion about the movie Selma. <laughs> Question, which historical figure does the movie focus on? That's right. The movie focuses on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his followers during the voting rights marches of 1965. This movie is available to rent on Amazon Prime and is a really great way to, divide, to dive deeper into the topic of racial injustice as a church community. Watch the movie beforehand. Log on to the Zoom link in your bulletin next Sunday from 5 to 6.15 p.m. Contact Violet if you have any questions. Last announcement, meet the Garcios. The Bay Area is in a huge need for new churches to reach out to new people and spread the gospel. So that's why Gabe and Carrie Garcia came to join us and plant a new church. So please join them on Zoom to meet them and hear about their vision for their church in Oakland. <laughs> Question, how long have the Garcias been in the Bay? That's right, three months. They've been here for three months, yet most of us have not met them yet. So, this is a perfect time to do so. As Gabe said last week, you gotta be there. It is the event of the century. He didn't say that, but I'm predicting. Uh, join them two weeks from now on Sunday, August 9th at 12.30 p.m. That's it. Count up your points. Declare your winners. Thanks for joining today for Sundays at Solano. See you next time. All right, thanks Esther. You never know what you're gonna get with her, so that was, um, that was fun. I didn't score any points, by the way, I got them wrong. Uh, we're gonna sing one more song, spend some time uh, just uh, reflecting uh, and, and sort of move us back into the spirit of the message that, uh, that's been brought to Andrew today, so um, join us.
of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. 
Well, we had a blessed time on vacation. My family and I have been gone for the last two weeks, and so we're so grateful for that. Thank you to Patria and to Gabe, who brought the sermons these last two weeks. And Martin has hooked us up on uh, iTunes and, and Spotify podcasts. So if you're missing any of these, you can go and uh, find them there, listen to them in your car, whatever. And I encourage you to do that with these last two weeks and, and all the weeks um, that, uh, that you might have missed. Uh, to be strengthened and encouraged during this time, as I said, uh, Barna study showing that people who continue in worship are finding much less anxiety than those who do not in a recent study. Uh, I want to thank you, too, for all who participated in the series we finished on racism. Uh, and this week, I'm going to be meeting with the Faith and Race team to discuss our next steps. I know some of you are wondering what those might be, and so we're in the process of working that out. But today, we're going to return to the book of Acts, uh, returning to our series in the book of Acts. The book of Acts is about uh, the beginnings of the church itself, and the early church was, was birthed really amidst uh, chaotic times. And so, this continues to be a great book for us to study because we are in the midst of chaotic times. For example, uh, we catch the Apostle Paul today as he's waiting in an unfamiliar place and uh, Athens is the name of it. You might have heard of it. And, and what he thought was going to be wasted time opens up into one of the most significant opportunities that he has in his life. And it's something that we continually go back to and we talk about his time in Athens and the interactions he had with people there. Uh, and this can be true of us as well as we are waiting in our uncertain, unfamiliar time. Uh, what will God do in the midst of this season that we have? Uh, we're waiting, but, you know, it's not just waiting in futility. God is at work. So would you open up with me to the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 21. And we're going to spend a little time this morning exploring what exactly this waiting looks like. What are you waiting for? So the context here in the book uh, of Acts in chapter 17 is that Paul is in Athens. He's on this journey with fellow co-workers, ministry partners. They're going from city to city. They're sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. People are coming to believe in Jesus Christ. They're starting churches in various cities. In the midst of their travels, Paul finds himself in Athens, and he's waiting for Silas and Timothy to meet him there. And that's where we pick up the story. It says, now while Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with him, and some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting. For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know therefore what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling and hearing something new. What to do while you're waiting. Paul could play the tourist, and it does start off that way. He's wandering through Athens, looking at all the sights that there are to see, and he's observing what is there. Much like during this pandemic, you know, we uh, could hide in our homes and uh, make our lives comfortable and ease. But playing the tourist is not enough for Paul as he begins to take in the people and the surroundings in Athens. And I don't think hiding is quite enough for us either as we settle into the long stretch that this pandemic has become. God meant Paul for more than merely being a tourist in Athens. And he means you more for more than merely hiding and pursuing ease during the pandemic that we're all 
weathering. So let me hear, hear me say this again, that God has more for you than to merely exist or endure or sustain or subsist or survive or scrape by during this time. And as always is the case with God, the more has to do with people and it has to do with love and it has to do with compassion. As Paul walks the streets in Athens, he sees that it's really, the language says, smothered in idols. There's, there's, I, everywhere, everywhere he turns, idols, statues to various gods, which represent people's pursuits for hope and for understanding and for changing the world around them, for dealing with their circumstances. Now, idols are a lot less strange to us moders, moderns than we might think. An idol is simply anything, listen to this, this is how you define an idol, anything by which we attempt to organize our lives in an ultimate sense. It doesn't have to be a statue. It's anything by which we attempt to organize our lives in a kind of ultimate sense. It could be something like comfort, right? We order our lives around the pursuit of comfort. It could be control. We try to manage every circumstance so that it comes out in the way that we would want it to come out. It could be approval. So, you know, everything you do, all your decisions are based on whether or not you will elicit approval from the people around you. These also are types of idols. And the problem with idols, besides there being an affront to a loving and holy God, that's, a, that's an extremely important element of idolatry. Um, but, but setting that aside for now, just besides that really important aspect, um, is that idols never have the power to lead us to fulfill our God-given calling as human beings. If you've tried to live by comfort or uh, control or approval, you've discovered that to be true. No idol has the power to lead us to fulfill our God-given calling as human beings. They all end up leaving us empty and worse, separated from the God who made us and who loves us and who is the intended object of of our worship. See, like it or not, as human beings, we will order our lives by some standard. We will put something at the center of our lives. And the one intended to be in that place is the Creator God. And when we put anything else in that central space in our lives, it ends up resulting in our destruction. So here's Paul. He is in Athens, and he sees all of these idols, and his heart is utterly broken. See what it says there in that first verse. His spirit was provoked within him. His heart is utterly broken for the people of Athens. How can he act like a tourist when people's lives are on the line? How can we choose to hide in comfort and ease when the people around us are hurting and broken, you know, right in the beginning of the Bible, we have this question, you know, uh, am I my brother's keeper? And, and, and as we read the Bible, we discover that the answer to that question, cover to cover, is in fact, we are our brother's keeper. We are our sister's keeper. And Paul's heart is like a little window into the heart of God. And God is engaged in the long, hard work of transforming, of forming our hearts in a similar fashion, such that when we see another image bearer, we would be provoked to love and anything that would be destructive in that image bearer's life would be a front not only to God but to us as well because our longings are out of love and compassion for the other. Like Paul then, we're compelled to tell people about this good news of the God who created 
and, and loved and comes to us and, and seeks to reside in the central place in our lives and to, to be the operating, ordering um, um, factor in all that we are and all that we do. It's our debt of love to speak about this God, to offer this God. So I can tell where, I can imagine where you're headed right now. You're thinking, okay, uh, Pastor Andrew's about to ask me to, to share the gospel, right, with others. And, 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 and you're thinking, oh no. Um, my wife sent me an article uh, from the Babylon Bee a while back. Uh, you may be unfamiliar with the Babylon Bee. It's a satirical news outlet uh, written by Christians, but satirizing Christian culture. I recommend it. It's good for us to, to laugh at ourselves from time to time. And uh, this article is about telling people about Jesus. Columbia, South Carolina, it says, Local woman Michelle Desmond tragically dropped dead of a sudden acute feeling of awkwardness Wednesday evening while sharing the gospel with one of her coworkers. A representative for persecuted church ministry, Open Doors, confirmed. Desmond was seen asking her associate from the accounting department whether or not he believed in God as the two exited the building for the night when the awkwardness attack occurred, leaving the 29-year-old customer service representative crumpled on the floor as the co-worker ran to get help. The tragedy confirms many American Christians' worst fears that the sense of discomfort which usually arises when telling an acquaintance about Jesus could potentially be fatal. This just goes to show you how dangerous it is to share the gospel in closed countries like America, the Open Doors representative said. You really have to count the cost before you decide to open your mouth and proclaim his truth in your middle-class suburban neighborhood. You could lose everything. Are you prepared to suffer potentially deadly Super awkward feeling for the sake of Jesus, he added. So the awkwardness that has the potential to kill us, Paul felt that exact same thing. It says in the text, they called him a babbler. What's a babbler? The word actually literally means a seed picker. And it referred to a teacher who just assembled random thoughts and tried to pass them off as coherent. Now, this is true uh, how we often feel. And and yet, the reality of the awkwardness problem is often quite different from what we might be experiencing on that inside, that sense of, of death even, as we share the good news of Jesus Christ. Rick Richardson has written a book recently called, You Found Me. And there are all kinds of statistics about the interaction between Christians and others in this book, and one of them uh, was particularly striking to me. It says, The unchurched respond to the question, If a friend of mine really values their faith, I don't mind them talking about it. 35% of people who wouldn't conceive of themselves as being connected to any kind of church experience ag agree with that statement, that they don't mind if somebody really values their faith if that person will talk to them about it. 45% somewhat agree. Okay? So you've got a huge majority who are essentially open to you talking about this part of who you are, which has become the most important thing in your life. Right? This huge majority of people are willing to have a conversation with you, if it's genuine and sincere and authentic. 13% somewhat disagree and 5% strongly disagree. So some, a very small minority will call you a babbler like they did Paul. But it's a risk that is worth taking. Why? Because Jesus came into this world for love. In fact, he taught for love, he healed for love, and he went all the way to the point of being willing to die for love of other. And then he commissioned us for love. 
that the good news, the message of his love might be carried from person to person. That the blessing of knowing the creator and the redeemer might be passed one to another, uh, bringing its fruitfulness and goodness and hope and joy. It's all because of love. And here we are, we're waiting and, and we're looking around town right now, just like Paul in Athens. And, you know, the question, the big question that this text is kind of laying before us this morning, before you this morning, is will you take the opportunity in this period of waiting to truly love? To love in the way Paul loves. Even when people might experience it at first as not loving, you know deep in the fabric of your soul, that it's the most loving thing to do, to speak about the one who has demonstrated a perfect love for you in the person of Jesus Christ. And here's an interesting aspect that comes out of this text as well. Look, look at Paul's context in Athens and how similar it is to our context in the Bay Area. Some of us feel intimidated about sharing our faith in a context like this. We, we look at the fact that there are so few Christians, relatively speaking, in the Bay Area compared to other parts of our country and, and even other parts of the world, and, and that intimidates us. We look at the intellectualism in our area, and sometimes that causes us to feel like we, we can't even begin to speak about our faith unless we've got answers to all the hard questions, which is, by the way, something we will never have. There will always be mysteries as we go about sharing our knowledge of Jesus and, and the faith that we have, there will always be mysteries. We can't wait until we have it all figured out. And these and other factors cause us to be intimidated. Uh, but we need to be reminded that if the message of the gospel was powerful there in Athens during the time of Paul, then it can be powerful here in the Bay Area in our time because, because the two are similar in some really important ways. Let me just briefly highlight three similarities between Athens and the Bay Area. The first one, um, you know, the storyline here in the Bay Area and, and wherever you have a secular mindset that's really taken hold is that in our modern area, era, excuse me, what we've done is we've, we've lost or we've sloughed off or we've been liberated. We've liberated ourselves from this quote-unquote illusion of there being a God. And what we're left with is, is a naturalistic understanding of the world around us. And, and this naturalistic understanding is free from myths like the Bible. And so finally, we're living with a pure awareness of truth, of, of what the world really is. But the secular mind is, is not really free. It too is filled with with idols. It's part of the human condition, Christian, non-Christian, this temptation towards idolatry. And the same idols that affect those who are wrestling to keep Jesus at the center affect those who have no relationship with God at all. The same ones, the ones I've mentioned, comfort and control and approval. These are particularly American idolatries. Uh, and, and many more, like power, the idol of power and, and privilege, maintaining that sense of privilege, you know, ordering our lives. We've been talking about this in our series on racism, ordering our lives so that we could maintain that sense of privilege. And, and politics, we're entering in, into a heavy political season. And, and when we think that politics are going to be the answer, the solution to the problems of this broken world, we're practicing a kind of idolatry. Now, they're part of it, right? And that's the way this so often is. It's, it's that these are important things, but they're not ultimate things. Politics are important, but they're not ultimate. 
And other things like, like uh, various ideologies can take that central place. And we've got myriad of them present today. And, 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 and things like, like sex or, or addictions to uh, unhealthy things. Um, so much of what we turn into idols is, is good at the outset and, and a necessary part of our lives, but was never meant to be the ultimate determiner of our lives, to take that central place in our lives. And so people order their lives around the pursuit of, of these kinds of idols all the time. So our cities are like Athens. Our city, like all human cities, is filled with idols. And these idols are working their destructive force in people's lives all around us. Even the good things, when they're made into ultimate things, have the power to bring destruction. And so, so the loving thing for us to do is to be part of freeing people from the destructive idolatries that dot our landscape, just like there in Athens where Paul was. And, and this is what Jesus does. Jesus helps us to reorder our lives so that the only one who is truly worthy of worship of defining and ordering our lives, right? This is the amazing thing, that a human being is so precious, so remarkable amidst all the the universe of things. A human being is so remarkable and so precious to God that nothing in this world is good enough actually to be the object of worship for that human being except the one who made the human being, the creator God. See? So we settle, we diminish ourselves, we diminish what we were intended to be when we set our worship on things that are less than the God of the universe. And so the loving thing to do is to help people rightfully place that God at the center of their lives. Similarity too. You know, Paul interacted with, it says in this text, Epicurean and Stoic philosophers while he was in Athens. And the caricature, caricature of these two philosophies is that, you know, of course, the, the Epicurean are the ones who pursued all kinds of passions and, and pleasures, while the Stoics believed in, you know, um, controlling their emotions with well, we have a word for it now, stoicism, right? Is to be emotionless, to face all kinds of circumstances without any response. You know, actually, it was a bit more nuanced than that. Um, the Epicureans believed in, in sort of a muted pursuit of very reserved kinds of, of, of pleasures like food and friends. So it wasn't this sort of wild pursuit of, of all kinds of passions. And the Stoics believed that, uh, you know, resolutely submitting yourself to, and aligning yourself with the circumstances that have come upon you was a way to make it through life and to live properly. But here's the thing that both the Epicureans and the Stoics had in common, is that they believed either that there was no God at all, or they believed that if there is any gods out there, they're so distant as to be really non-factors in our daily existence, to be so removed that there would be no interaction with the individual person. Now, I would submit that many of our friends and our relatives and our neighbors and our associates here in our place and far flung around the world have this same view of the world. There is no God, and if there is, He's so distant that, and impersonal that He doesn't really factor in to my life. But Jesus is actually called Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is God saying, I'm not far off, actually, and I do care about you, and I would love to come, and he says, make my home with you, even as you shelter in place. Jesus is the presence of God in the world. Similarity three. We can see in this phrase, 
another similarity to the Bay Area, that the people in Athens would spend their time in telling in nothing except telling or hearing something new. And for all of our wealth and influence and you might say sophistication um, in a place like where we live, it's, it's true that if you dig below the surface, um, you will find that many have not found what they're looking for in a spiritual sense. Um, if you will just take time to sit and to learn and to know, you will find the same kind of angst that we all struggle with um, about the meaning of life and the purpose of life is, is present all throughout the people of our society. And, and it's, it's part of our lives too. This is, this is what drives us towards God. We, we assume this is part of the human condition. There's an emptiness, an insecurity, um, a hunger, a, a malaise um, that is yet to be met by any of the new things that are told and heard among us in this place, in our time. And Jesus understands that. He speaks directly into this spiritual hunger. And, and I have to imagine that this is part of what, what Paul was speaking as he interacted with the Epicureans and the, the Stoic philosophers and, and all the other people telling, it says, of Jesus and the resurrection. Jesus meets that that hunger for longing and for meaning. He says things like this, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. He says, I came that they, and, and he's referring here essentially to his hearers, which includes us, that you may have life and have it abundantly, right? Right? And then he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, Jesus is referring to himself there, you would have asked him, Jesus, and he would have given you living waters. So bread, um, abundant life, living waters. These are the things that Jesus offers to answer the deepest hungers that plague all peoples, the part of the human condition, Christian or non-Christian. We all have these deep longings, and Jesus is the response of God to them. So if the gospel has something to say to Athens, it has something to say to our place, to the Bay Area, wherever you live, to your neighborhood, to your friends, to your relatives, to your associates, your co-workers, your neighbors. If the gospel is love to Athens, the gospel is love to the Bay Area. So I want to invite you today to take a page from the life of Paul and to wait like Paul. Whatever the nature of your waiting right now, whether it's you know, for a personal crisis to pass, because I know there's layers in this whole season that we're in. I mean, we're all experiencing this collective waiting, but then in the midst of that, we've each got our own unique circumstances, and, and, and we're waiting for them to pass. We're waiting for them to be resolved. So if you're waiting for some deep personal circumstance to be resolved, to be redeemed, or if you're just waiting, passing the time of this pandemic, whatever it is, wait like Paul, which is to say, wait in love. Let your spirit be provoked by the brokenness and the sin and the loss and the hunger and the malaise that surrounds all of us. Let your heart be broken. Allow God to open the, the window of your heart to see the world with his eyes with compassion and with love. And then, and then speak, as, as it says Paul did, of Jesus and the resurrection. You know, live a life of love as you wait. You know, when we do that, it's like suddenly what we thought was a time of meaninglessness becomes a time of, of powerful meaning 
and purpose. You know, this doesn't have to be wasted time. It's, it's not wasted time. It's very important time. One of the things I love about the book of Acts is that no matter what happens, the first impulse of those early Christians are, is to ask, what is God doing right now? And how can I jump in to the stream of what God is doing? One of the most powerful examples of this, we studied it not too long ago, was when there was an earthquake when Paul was in jail. And instead of running out of the jail and just sort of saying, I'm going to get mine and be free, you know, Paul and his companions who were stuck in that jail, they asked the important question, God, what do you want us to do in this moment? And the answer is to tell the jailer and to tell the people in the jail about Jesus. So instead of going running out, they used that moment as an opportunity to see God move in some powerful, beautiful, transformational ways. And the same is true for you today. Your question is, how am I going to wait this out? How am I going to get to the next thing? How am I going to Make sure I've got mine in the midst of all the struggle that's happening. The question is, God, what are you doing? And what do you want to do through me to be a conduit of your love? That's the question that we want to be asking in this really important moment. Live a life of love as you wait. And let him say, you know, you bring some strange things to our ears. That's what they said about Paul. You bring some strange things to our ears. Okay, Let's talk about that. Why is it strange? Where does the strange, strangeness come from? What is it saying? Right? A life of love. If this feels overwhelming to you, let me finish with just a few measures, some suggestions to help you to get started. Some of this will be really familiar to you. Some will be new invitation to some of you. I want to encourage you this week to embrace what we call this rhythm of life. We, we call it the Pabst Rhythm of Life, which stands for prayer, pray, ask, bless, share, tell. P-A-B-S-T, Pabst. Pray, ask, bless, share, tell. And all of this, in, in my hope, comes out of the, the gospel. As you interact with others, as you walk in your neighborhood, as you meander through social media, as you connect with people far flung. I know there's a lot of reconnecting, rekindling old relationships that's taking place during this pandemic as we're waiting at home and have extra time to make phone calls to old friends. As you do all of those things, right? Do it with a, with a, with a, a ponderance, a prayerfulness. Pray this simple prayer. God, use me as a conduit of your love in the lives of the people that you have brought into my sphere. God, use me. Just, you don't even know the answer yet of what that's going to look like. And that's okay. Just offer up that willingness, that prayer to say, God, use me. Use me in the lives of the image bearers that are around me. And then you want to start in your relationships to be like Jesus and to ask questions. Jesus asked so many questions. And when he was asking questions, what he was doing on some level is he was affirming what the Bible teaches, that every human being is made in the image of God. Every person matters. When you take an interest in another person, you are saying essentially, you matter to me. And that becomes a stepping stone for them to understand that they matter to God. So ask questions, show interest, ask about the past, ask about dreams for the future, ask about their struggles, ask about their joys, learn about the people, the precious image bearers that God has brought into your life. And an interesting thing happens when you do that. As you learn about people, you sometimes discover there are ways that you can become a blessing to that person. They have a need, you have the solution. They have a need, you have the resources. And so part of what it means to live in this rhythm is to become a blessing to others. And that means sometimes you got to change your schedule. Sometimes you got to be generous and give up things that you would love. But you know what? It all goes back to Jesus. Jesus was willing to give his very life for you and for me. 
And so we can stand to be a little generous with our time and with our resources and with the things that we have for the image bearers, the precious image bearers around us. And then you never know what happens next. Sometimes, you know, I think especially in the Bay Area, you catch people in this sort of what I call cognitive dissonance, this confusion, because they're like, um, I know what a Christian is, and I read the papers about them, and they all live over there, and I like to hate them. And now you're in my life, though, flesh and blood, and you say some things that are strange to my ears, but you're, you also are loving, and I like you because you have shown me grace and love. You have favor, you have favor with people, right? And in those moments, you get to tell them, share with them how God is working in your life. What is it that makes you tick? What, what's important to you, they may ask. Um, why are you th- doing this? Why are you this way? And, you know, to be able to share how God is moving in your life is a really powerful thing. Now, that requires some authenticity. It requires you being able to say, you know what? Um, I'm struggling in this area, and here's how God's meeting me. Such an important element of of our sharing is to be willing to be vulnerable with others, to be authentic. You know, I prayed about this. I'm struggling with this. And here's how God is, is meeting me in my need, right? Powerful witness and testimony. And then lastly, the T, telling. Telling the good news of Jesus. You know, the gospel has the solution to idolatry and to sin. Idolatry is just a form of sin. And when, when God said, how are we going to deal with the sin on the earth? He said, okay, I'm going to step in. He stepped in in the person of Jesus. And he, 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 he took presence in our midst and he taught. But then the amazing thing he did was, was to offer himself an atoning sacrifice for sin, for idolatry, which offends a holy God, and for sin. Jesus offered himself as that atoning sacrifice. And to be able to tell that, you know, for all the things that you've done that continue to bear heavy on your conscience, to be able to tell somebody there's a solution for that, you can be freed from that, what a wonderful thing to be able to tell somebody. And you can tell them because of what Jesus has done on the cross. All right. This week, I invite you to embrace the Pabst rhythm of life. Two other very short things. I want to invite you to join me on Thursdays. A group of us have been meeting. We probably met seven, time, seven times so far um, for this little cohort we're calling Sent in Place. On Thursdays over Zoom at lunchtime, 12 to 12.45, 45 minutes. Here's what we do. We spend 15 minutes thinking about one subject related to sharing your faith. And we just talk about it. And then we spend 15 minutes telling stories about relationships that we have and the ways God is working in our midst. And then we spend 15 minutes praying, really tight, very concise. But I got to tell you, over the last weeks, those times have been some of the most encouraging for me as I seek to, to live out the love of Christ in my life, to be somebody who loves like Jesus. Those have been some of the most important times. So I want to invite you, and we'll be putting links wherever all over this week, Thursday from 12 to 1245, this Thursday, to join us for our Sent in Place cohort. We had one conversation that really stood out. We talked about how is God moving you know, this is in the beginning of shelter in place. How is God moving through social media? And I tell you, the stories that people had about the opportunities God was providing for them to share their faith through their social media interactions, things that hadn't happened before we were sheltering in place. It was amazing. See, we're not just waiting here as tourists. God has work for us to do. And then lastly, I want to encourage you. This is a, this is a step of faith for me. It's a step of faith for you. It's a step of faith for all of us. I want to encourage you to invite your friends or your relatives or your associates or your neighbors to join our streaming worship next Sunday. Next Sunday, we're going to get into the the passage where Paul actually gives his lecture sermon to the the people in the Areopagus. It's a famous text. Um, And what I'm going to do is sort of mirror that text for our present modern condition and speak the gospel into some of what I hope are the deep needs of the day. And so I want to encourage you to take a risk and invite somebody to join our stream next Sunday and just see what happens. I know it's not going to be perfect, but you know, let's just take the risk as a church and let's just not wait 
Let's, let's allow God to move in and through us. And, 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 and don't be afraid of the awkwardness, but to make that invitation because next Sunday we're going to try and articulate the best we can the gospel for this time and this place. It's the loving thing to do. Be loving. Make that invitation. So God, um, all of this is so much greater than who we are oftentimes. And yet we know you've given us a very simple role, which is simply to be faithful. And so we want to thank you that you are going to be working in our midst over this next week as we step out in faith, um, fearlessly uh, meeting that sense of awkwardness, um, choosing not to be afraid of being called a babbler or saying things that seem strange to the people around us. God, we want to step out in faith. We don't want to be looking back and, and feeling like we've wasted this time when you wanted to do important, eternal things in people's lives, people that we love, people that you love. And so meet us this week, we pray in Jesus' name. Um, that, that teaching that Jesus is close to us is expressed in this table. And so I want to invite you as we move towards the end of our worship time to come to this table. If, if you've got um, something in your house that you can use as bread and wine to be able to share with the people there with you. Please um, get that now. On the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. This table is open to all who placed their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Um, we invite all people who are with us right now to make this important prayer. Um, if you haven't had a relationship with God to this point, would you even just call out into what might feel like the void to you? But I believe there's a God who's listening to call out, Lord, if you're there, show yourself to me. And then just see what happens throughout the course of this week. One of the beautiful things about this table also is that it's a reflection of our community. I've been on the phone with a lot of people this week. And one of the things that really struck me is that you all are working to find community. You're reaching out to one another. And that's such a beautiful thing to see. This table calls us to that, recalls us to that as we continue to do church in this unique way. So God, meet us at this table right now. Remind us of your goodness and your grace and your love for us, which is lavished upon us in Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Come to the table. It's open. It's ready for you.
Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 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 Who can stop the Lord our God is the lion? He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. 
Paul and his friends were in a place called Macedonia, they um, had an encounter with a woman that I want to read to you briefly as we finish up. It says, And on the Sabbath day we went outside to the gate to the riverside, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. She had some understanding, but it was incomplete. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her household as well, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. I love the warmth of that story, the transformation of that story. I want to leave you with this morning is that there are more stories just like that one to be written in our time and in our place with the people that we know. So as we finish up today, would you go with a sense of hope and faith and courage to be one of the ones who helps to make those stories come about by loving people faithfully and sharing your faith. Let's go in his grace. Amen. Yeah.